So, what is an irresistible impulse? Let us then consider... Oh, wait a second, what the hell is this? Twinkies. Hmm. How many of you were horrified that Twinkies were taken out of production, but another company rallied and picked up the Twinkie manufacturer? Right? So, uh, the food that never goes bad. A uh, hundred years from now, people will find Twinkies and, and find them still to be in the same condition they were pre... That, that's the joke about Twinkies. Further refinements to not guilty by reason of insanity. Well, we're going to talk about what was labeled by the press the Twinkie defense. So, hang on, right? Rather, it was an accumulation of 18 years of problems and patchwork solutions and above all, simple exasperation. Right. However, the newer guidelines provided the foundation for a wide array of ingenious and some say frivolous defense strategies. One of those was the most famous, one of the most famous was the Twinkie defense of 1970s. So let's look at the case that spawned the descriptor, the Twinkie defense. Who am I? Number 13. Anybody? This is a tough one. There was a movie that came out, oh, it's quite a while ago. Uh, maybe a movie that you're unlikely to have seen. I've been teaching this course so long now, the examples get, get kind of nebulous at times. Uh, the movie was named Milk, if anyone remembers that. So, what do we know? Well, who am I number 13? Killed Mayor George Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk, hence the name of the movie, in 1978. Right? So he killed a mayor and a supervisor in San Francisco. San Francisco, this is San Francisco City Supervisor Dan White. And he got voluntary manslaughter as opposed to murder as a result of his defense. Right? So what happened? Well, Dan White got into the supervisor position, expect to pull strings uh, and, and financially get zoning permissions, etc., all, all these other issues to augment his finances, but he got in there, there was a resistance from other politicians that essentially destroyed him financially, right? So he ended up serving five of his seven-year sentence. How did this occur? Well, that White committed these murders was never in dispute since he shot both men in at midday in San Francisco City Hall. But at the trial, the defense claimed that White was suffering from a mental lapse brought on by a series of events in life that left him temporarily insane. Right? Psychologists testified the murder trial postulated that White was not responsible for the murders, even though he carried extra ammunition with him to City Hall and reloaded between the killings. His attorney said depression put him into an altered state that changed his behavior to such a degree that he began to eat junk food, something he had never done according to his defense, and it was the effects of the junk food that destroyed his ability to control himself. Well, he served five or seven years, he was released, he committed suicide within two years after his release, right? Was he suffering depression? Most assuredly, you know, and, and uh, it's a horrible disorder and, and the stressors just kept accumulating on him and ultimately he saw his fellow politicians as the source of his inability to make things happen that he wanted to make happen financially uh, and thus he lashed out at them. Pretty simple. Now, legal definitions then? Well, now... The McNaughton Rule, okay, is stood kind of the test of time, 26 states, still used by the federal government. But now we have to look and, and think that this, this patchwork solution, is, as was described in the previous slide, this patchwork solution, what rules does it yield? Well, we have the Durham Rule, and this is also known as the Product Rule. The accused is not criminally responsible if the act was a product of a mental disease or defect. Right? So now notice we don't have a right or wrong test like in the McNaughton rule. Right? But the downside to this rule is the judges felt that we put way too much emphasis on the testimony of psychiatrists and really diminishes the juror's role 
as the ultimate fact finders. Basically what the, the product rule is saying, hey, this act that you've witnessed is the product of their mental disease and therefore they cannot be held accountable for it. That is the psychiatrist is giving this ultimate opinion and it leaves no decision making latitude for anyone else. This is not a rule that's going to take hold, right? This is, this is taking the power away from too many people who want to maintain the power, but ultimately the jury. Now, the Bronner rule, though, different rule, and this one gains some traction. Defendant is not guilty if mental disease or defect causes them to lack substantial capacity to either appreciate the criminality of their conduct, which is very much like McNaughton, or they're unable to conform their conduct to the law, so they have an inability to follow the law, right? as a result of their mental disease or defect. This is also known as the ALI rule, the American Legal Institute rule, and this is used in 22 states. Now, this still allows the jury considerable latitude in decision making. So, we see we have two rules now. We have McNaughton and we have Bronner, Durham. Yeah, I want you to know Durham, but and I want you to understand why Durham didn't fly, right? Why it didn't gain hold. So, who am I? Number three. Let's take a look at these rules and apply them. Who am I? Number three. Anyone? This is one of the easier ones of the bunch, right? John Wayne Gacy. And in studying these extreme examples of criminal behavior, uh, these murderers, check out his mugshot. Hey, we've just arrested you for murder. That's a hell of a smile that guy's sporting, right? And here he is, John Wayne Gacy, right? John Wayne Gacy was, was kind of a pillar of his community. He was a, a local contractor. He hired a lot of people, especially he hired a lot of young men, employed a lot of young men. And uh, in his spare time, he would dress up as a clown and volunteer to entertain various groups in his community. You know, so this is a suburban community of Chicago, and, and he is definitely embedded and involved in his community, right? From a business and a volunteer aspect. Now, Gacy's psychiatrist. Well, what do we know? Well, one thing, <laughs> one thing we know is Morrison details the highlights of her discussion with Gacy as they prepared for trial, as well as his letters to her afterward. She knew him for some 14 years. While her rendition of Gacy's defense is accurate, her insistence that he could not control himself during his 33 episodes of murderous violence rings false for those familiar with the prosecution's side. So wait a second, let's back up here. Gacy has killed 33 young men. Now notice, when we look at Bundy, Bundy had killed probably 30 some or more young women, all of a very similar age and appearance. Gacy has killed 33 young men. Right? All of a similar age. That, that often killers have this target of attraction, kind of this profile of people that interest them uh, in terms of being victims. Right? A few of uh, Gacy's defense shortcomings then. There are issues that none of the defense psychiatrists managed to address, and, and this is what is eroding Gacy's defense in front of the murder. If Gacy had 33 irresistible impulses, just how was it that he was digging graves in advance? Now, when we think of Dan Sickles, who finds out that he's being cheated upon, flies into a rage and runs out into the street and commits a murder at a specific target, that's a little different. How do you explain having an irresistible impulse to kill this person, and then kill that person, and then kill this person, and then kill that person, and be digging graves in the crawl space underneath your house for your victims even before you've killed them? That ain't gonna fly, right? Not, no juror's gonna go there. Can one plan for supposed spontaneous homicidal behavior? And if his memory for what he did was so scattered, as Morrison indicates, how did he draw maps of how he had buried each of the victims? How was he able to carry on business over the phone, even as he was in the process of killing Rob Peist, right? So here he is, and what he does is after 
these young men spend the day working for him. Gacy says shit like, hey, I got some beer at home or I got some weed at home. Why don't you come back with me and, and we'll get high and, and just relax after a hard day's work. And then they would come back and he would kill them. And he was a trophy hunter, so he actually they found a box in his house of things that he kept from the victims, and he buried their bodies under the house. So here's a diagram of his house, right? And uh, a, another hand-drawn diagram of the house. But I think what's more chilling is, let's check this out. Here is a photograph of the crawl space underneath his house, and you notice it's about three feet to the floor joists from ground level. You can see some of the plumbing pipes running underneath the house. But each one of those stakes with the little paper flag on it, numbered, let's see, 1, number 12, number 8, number 9, number 7, and all the ones that you can't see further back, these are graves. These are graves of Gacy's victims that he buried under the house. Gacy was a prolific killer. There's no two ways about it. No. And, and one thing to understand about Gacy is the sheer audacity of Gacy. His wife left because she suspected something was going on. He continued to kill and bury people under his house. His neighbors complained of the odor and stench to people in the city and to Gacy himself. Gacy had pest control workers coming out to get rid of these unknown insects. And these are insects that specialize in consuming cadavers. I mean, and, and he explained his plumbing backups and all this other stuff. Uh, he, he just continued on with these crimes. And there was a young man, a high school student, who decided he wanted to write a report on serial killers. And he thought he'd really kick his report in the ass. So he started writing to people to see if anyone would respond. And Gacy did, in fact, respond to him. And over a period of time corresponding, Gacy invited the student to prison to visit him and discuss the crimes. Gacy's alleged intent was to, in fact, get this young man in the prison and then kill him in the prison. Gacy is a work, right? Uh, there's no two ways about it. Uh, Gacy was in Joliet prison. He was sentenced to death, and he was put to death in, in Joliet. So... All of this then, when we're thinking, hey, these are the rules, but remember, we're talking psychology and law here. And when we talk psychology, we have to think in terms of perception. Just because these rules exist for jurors, do jurors actually use the rules, or do they use the rules as the legal system intends them to use the rules? Well... The general belief that the defendant is mentally ill to the point of inability to plan or control behavior, right? So if the jury believes, after hearing the testimony, that in fact the defendant is mentally ill and their mental illness interferes with their ability to control their behavior, then the jurors are more, or more likely than to go with endorsing an insanity defense and finding the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity. If they hear expert testimony that isn't challenged by the prosecution about the defendant's mental illness, then they're willing to go along with it. But notice, in an adversarial system, it's almost always court-appointed psych psychologists on either side arguing. Right? Now, this one... I th think is the most important, and this one probably resonates with most of us to this greatest extent. If you're sitting on a jury, and you can't find a logical motive for this crime, like they killed for money, or they killed out of jealousy, or you can't find a logical motive, and you're not willing to go to evil, because think, if we look at someone and we say, that person's evil, then we're willing to hold them accountable. So if you can't explain what happened as a juror in terms of logic, and you can't explain it in terms of evil, that leaves you willing to adopt an insanity or endorse an insanity defense, right? So more on, on this, this idea of evil later on. So who am I? Number two. A very short-term Buckeye is who this is. Are we, are we good to go now? You know who this is? This is, in fact, Jeffrey Dahmer. Right? And what do we know about Dahmer? Well, Dahmer claimed that he ate the flesh of his victims because he believed the people would come alive again in him. He tried various seasonings and, and, and meat tenderizers to make human flesh more tasty. 
Now, Dahmer has been interviewed extensively, and there's a fascinating interview you can find on YouTube uh, about Dahmer and his uh, interviewed with his father, and uh, Dahmer's father is interviewed. And, and Dahmer didn't have a, a great childhood. Uh, at one point, Dahmer came home as, as, I think he was 15, as a high school student, came home and found no one in, in, in the house, and it's, his family had left. They just left with no forwarding address. Mom, dad, and the younger brother. Just, bye, Jeffrey. So, this is not a good upbringing. He did experiment on animals, so he was an abuser and dissector of animals as a child. And, and that is, you know, people who abuse animals, that's, that's, that's never a good indicator, right, uh, for children to do that. Some people surmise that Dahmer kind of had this kind of abandonment issue then, and he had an affection for young men. And he would inject them with various substances, etc. Some people allege that he was trying to create zombies. So he would try and, and take some young man and zombify him, if, that, if that's a word, so that he could retain control over that person for as long as he wanted. Uh, obviously, these experiments were unsuccessful, and he was also a cannibal. He also ate people. Uh, cleaning out Dahmer's apartment must have been a gruesome mess when you think about it. Uh, you look in the refrigerator and there's all these various body parts, etc. There's drums uh, of liquids to try and, and dissolve. Uh, it's just a horrendous mess. Uh, one of the interesting incidents is uh, one of Dahmer's victims, potential victims, escaped, ran out of the house naked, right, right into the police. And Dahmer came out and he assured the police that the guy was just having a bad trip and they should allow Dahmer to take him back into the apartment. And the police didn't want to deal with it, so Dahmer took this guy back in and murdered him. Uh, these are people who have some breathtaking abilities, right? So, Boyle's defense consisted of some 45 witnesses that would attest to the various aspects of Dahmer's bizarre behavior and try to show that Dahmer's sexual and mental disorders prevented him from understanding the nature of his crime. That is, understanding the right and wrong, right? Every hideous detail of what Dahmer allegedly did with his victims and every nightmarish thing he ever entered into his head was fair game. Can you imagine being a juror on this trial? Ah, the level of disgust and horror that those jurors had to endure, right? The goal was to convince the jury that such alleged, action, alleged actions uh, and, and such alleged thoughts did not happen with a man that was sane. So they're building that case for insanity. Boyle threw the question out to the jury. Was he evil or was he sick? Had the jury at that point in time taken a vote, it's possible they would have agreed with Boyle. But... What we see is an effective prosecutor, McCann, and, and at McCann's turn to present his case, Domery told them was a master manipulator he w and a deceiver who knew exactly what he's doing every step of the, a the way. He was able to turn his urges on and off like a light switch. Right? And he used the example. Did he attack other soldiers while he was in the Army? No. Did he attack other students while at the Ohio State University? Uh-huh. Yeah, Dahmer was at Ohio State for a quarter. He didn't do well. He had a, a serious uh, alcohol problem and just couldn't do the school thing. Moral Tower, if you're wondering where he resided. So there you go. There's that. The deaths, he said, were not the acts of a madman, but the results of meticulous planning. And that's where the jury went. That, in fact... We believe that he knew what he was doing, uh, and one of the ideas is if you attempt to cover things up, then it typically demonstrates to the jury that you knew what you were doing enough to know that you should probably try to cover it up. Hence, uh, Dahmer. Dahmer was killed in prison by another inmate. Uh, the, these are, are homosexually tinged murders, and for a lot of inmates, that's not going to fly. Uh, and so... Uh, he, and also it was a status thing, killing Dahmer, you know, now you, you got bragging rights, I killed Dahmer. And, and you have to understand, for a lot of in, inmates, especially in maximum security facilities, if you're in uh, for life with no chance of parole, you know, kill, killing someone is not like, oh, oh my God, they're going to put me in for double life? Uh, no, I mean, so, uh, such it is with Dahmer. So, the insanity defense, let's look at some stats here. It's been misconstrued. The public believes, 
large number of criminals use the insanity defense. The public tends to believe most defendants who use it are acquitted by gullible juries. What's the real numbers? Well, what, what do we see? It's used in about one two hundredth of the cases. One out of two hundred cases, the insanity defense is used and is successful in uh, one out of 102 of those. So it, it doesn't seem to be in a very... Ve uh, first of all, it's not used often. Right, that's 0.25% of the uh, one in 200 is point. 5% of the time and it's successful only 1% of the time that it's used. So it's it's not a winning defense, right? Silver at all, let's look at some more data. Used about 1% uh, of the time, if you will. Successful in about 2 of 9 cases. So again, not used often and not very effective. So, defendants found not guilty by reason of insanity are released into society. Nope. Actually, most go directly to the mental hospital, the state hospital, and stay there for an average of about three years. And the interesting thing is, if you're remanded to the state mental hospital, you successfully pled not guilty by reason of insanity. You're remanded to the state mental hospital, and now you stay in the state mental hospital until the doctors say you're good to go. So think about it. If you were looking at a crime that carried a penalty of three years in prison, and you successfully use an insanity defense, you could conceivably go to the state mental hospital and be held for 5, 10, 15 years. And one flew over the cuckoo's nest is a, gr is a great example of that, the movie with Jack, Jack Nicholson. Right? He advanced successfully and not guilty by reason of insanity plea. Uh, he was sent to a mental hospital and he thought he'd be out after six months or a year or whatever, and, they, and it was a great scene where he's in the pool, and he's talking to one of the people who works in the mental hospital and says, yeah, two more weeks. And the guy says, what are you talking about? He says, well, I'm out here in two more weeks. And he says, I think you got that wrong, buddy. You're here until the doctor says you can go. Ooh, big wake-up call. Great movie, by the way. So, person, uh, persons found insane or extremely dangerous, uh, hard to judge, right? Committed and treated almost immediately, so it's hard to know about that. And evidence suggests that recidivism is about the same or slightly lower than typical criminals, so maybe not so much. Now, general criticisms of the insanity defense, well, sends criminals to the hospital and frees them. Well, no, all right? Uh, can be manipulated by psychopaths, well, yeah. And, and part of, I think, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest kind of demonstrates that. Uh, psychopaths, especially intelligent psychopaths, could probably persuade people that, in fact, they were uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. They might be able to pull that off. But that then becomes a very rare instance. First of all, we've seen how rarely the defense is used, right? Uh, it's a defense only for the rich. Well, I don't, that one is kind of a silly argument. It doesn't appear to be a socioeconomic or racial bias in this. Relies too much on psychiatric experts. Well, I will leave you to kind of uh, figure that out. All right. So, who am I? This was number one. Anyone? David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. Okay. What do we know about the son of Sam? The son of Sam was allegedly stalking people on the streets of Queens, New York, and shooting them in their cars. Uh, uh, I have an aside here. I just can't believe this. I mean, uh, I know some of us have t uh, tattoos. I have a couple. And I know a lot of you guys in class have tattoos. It's become all the rage, etc. Uh, but I'm going to... And you probably don't need to be tell, told this, but let's let's all assure each other that this is probably not the tattoo that we want to get. But it did win an award at the 2004 Springfield Tattoo uh, Expo. I don't. I'm like taken aback because I searched for pictures to the lecture, and here's someone with a tattoo, a portrait tattoo of Berkowitz on their calf, and I'm left saying, who gets a tattoo of Berkowitz, and why? And if that's not enough, if we, if we look in the background, the person has two calves, like most of us have two calves, and on the second calf, we have another portrait. Anyone uh, recognize that portrait? That's Charles Manson. I don't know. 
I imagine if this guy was, you know, interested in proposing to my stepdaughter back in the day at a pool party, and I see him come out in a swimsuit with these two tattoos, I'm like, uh, no way, no how, not ever, right? So, what do we know? Son of Sam is this mysterious character who's stalking people and shooting primarily brown-haired women and perhaps their dates who are parked in cars along the street in Queens. And when you think about New York, a lot of people live in, in relatively small apartments and maybe have many families in the small apartments. So one of the ways that you gain privacy strangely enough, is she go sit in your car out on the street. Well, we have Son of Sam stalking victims, popping up, assuming a two-handed posture, and shooting his 44 Special Charter Arms Bulldog Revolver at these targets and, and killing them with uh, great proficiency. Right. As an aside, that particular revolver, which is kind of a, a rare breed and a specialized revolver, was also then labeled by people in the gun industry as the Son of Sam special. So, go figure. Now, what we see is then the police once again really grasping at straws, trying to figure out who this guy is and somehow trying to catch him. And then what does the guy do? But he begins to taunt the police. And how does this take place? Well, let's check it out here. He sends letters to the police. Now, there's a lot of typos in this letter. I have transcribed the letter as it was written. So the typos are Son of Sam's, not mine. Dear Captain Joseph Borelli, who was leading the investigation, and this is well known through the papers, I'm deeply hurt by your calling me a women hater. I'm not. I'm a monster. I'm the son of Sam. I'm a little brat. When Father Sam gets drunk, he gets mean. He beats his family. Sometimes he ties me up to the back of the house. Other times he locks me in the garage. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill, commands Father Sam. Well, so it continues. Behind our house, some rest. Mostly young. Raped and slaughtered. Their blood drained. Just bones now. Papa Sam keeps me locked in the attic, too. I can't get out, but I look out the attic and watch the world go by. I feel like an outsider. I'm on a different wavelength than everybody else programmed to kill. However, to stop me, you must kill me. Attention all police. Shoot me first. Shoot to kill or else keep out of my way or you will die. Papa Sam is old now. He needs some blood to preserve his youth. He has too many heart attacks. Oog! Me hood, it hurts, sonny boy. I miss my pretty princess most of all. She's resting in Our Lady's house, but I'll see her soon. I'm the monster, Beelzebub, the chubby behemoth. I love to hunt, prowling the streets, looking for fair game, tasty meat. The women of Queens are the prettiest of all. It must be the water they drink. I live for the hunt. My life. Blood for Papa. Mr. Borelli, sir, I don't want to kill any more. No, sir, but I must honor thy father. I want to make love to the world. I love people. I don't belong to the earth. Return me to Yahoo's. Not the search engine. Biblical reference, right? I, to the people of Queens, I love you. And I, I want to wish you all a happy Easter. May God bless you in this life and the next. And now this last page is the actual handwritten document just to give you an idea of what it appears like. I say goodbye and good night, Police. Let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. To be interpreted as bang, 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 bang. Ugh. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. <sighs> what do you think of that? That is insane? Delusional? Where do you go with that? How does that strike you? How do you think a jury is going to respond to this? Right? Well, let's talk a little bit about Berkowitz's background. And it's, it's rife with some discrepancies, some contradictions. He was, but that's the, the way when you review people, when you talk to people, and did you know this guy, what did you think, right? And then you try to compile all that. You don't paint 
typically a consistent picture. He was always big for his age, and he always felt different and less attractive than his peers. All through his youth, he was uncomfortable with other people. He did have one sport, baseball, which he played well. His neighbors remember him as a nice-looking boy, but with a violent streak, a bully who assaulted neighborhood kids for no apparent reason. He was very hyperactive and difficult for Pearl and Nat to control uncle and aunt. Where are the parents? We don't know. Right? Anger and frustration with women, coupled by a bizarre fantasy life, started him down the road to violence when he got out of the army in 1974. The only consummated sexual experience with a woman that he ever had was a prostitute in Korea. He contracted a venereal disease disease as a souvenir. So is Berkowitz insane? Well, Kassara's German Shepherd, now, and, and let's think about this, Berkowitz lives in this rental house in Queens, New York, and he occupies the attic of this multi-story building. From the attic, he can look down to his neighbor Kassara's backyard. And Kassara has a German Shepherd in that backyard. Now, an interesting aside is Kassara has a son who may or may not be friends with Berkowitz. And Kassara's son and some of Kassara's friends deal in a satanic Bible and, and this kind of mysticism. To what extent they involve Berkowitz is uncertain because sources disagree on this. But Kassara's German Shepherd was a noisy dog and howled frequently. The neighborhood dogs howled back. In David's diseased mind, uh, demons lived within the dogs and their howling was the way they ordered David to go hunting for blood, the blood of pretty young women. Okay. So David was driven to the edge. He'd come home to Cleany Avenue at 6.30 in the morning because he was working as a baker, so he's working nights. It would begin then the howling. On my days off, I heard it all night. It made me want to scream. I used to scream out begging for the noise to stop. It never did. Right? Well, the demons never stopped. I couldn't sleep. No strength to fight. I could barely drive. Coming home from work one night, I, I almost killed myself in the car. I needed to sleep. The demons wouldn't give me peace. Now, situational components abound in Berkowitz's case. Berkowitz actually used a 22 rifle to shoot Casera's dog from his attic. Berkowitz shoots the dog. The dog appears to die. Berkowitz goes to sleep. Thing is, Kassara comes out, sees his dog, takes his dog to the vet, and the, the wound was not fatal. And the next day, the dog is back in the yard. Now, you can imagine, if Berkowitz is delusional, he sees this dog that he shoots and kills, resurrected, so to speak. Uh, to what extent this is true or not, right, uh, it might be in the realm of the unknown and the unknowable. But it paints a very strange picture. Berkowitz, they found a satanic Bible in his room. Is it planted there by Kassara's son and their friends? Because some people suspect that Kassara's son and his friends were committing these murders in conjunction with David. And then once David was caught, they just framed him up so that no one else would be implicated. That is unknowable at, at the same time as well. But let us then take a look at Berkowitz in terms of insanity. Okay, So not really. Uh, according to David Abertson, the prosecution's forensic psychologist, while the defendant shows paranoid traits, they do not interfere with his fitness to stand trial, hence he's competent. The defendant is normal as anyone else, maybe a little neurotic. Well, I mean, that might be a bit of an overstatement. I don't think Berkowitz is as normal as everyone else. But ultimately, it didn't matter because David Berkowitz pleaded guilty to the crimes and he was sentenced to 365 years in jail. Yeah. 365 years in jail. Uh, multiple counts. Not going to get out anytime soon. Now, if we look at Robert Ressler, a profiler, and, and note that these profilers love to interview people in prison to gain information to flesh out their decision process models. Remember that one we talked about? profiling, the decision process model. So you talk to offenders and you use that information to strengthen, make your, your decision models more, uh, more robust right, and more predictive. So this is the holy grail as these people try to interview these folks. A wrestler made it clear he didn't buy the demon dog theory one bit and eventually he was able to get the truth out of Berkowitz. 
The demon story was just to protect him when and if he was caught so that he could try and convince authorities he was insane. He admitted to Ressler that the real reason for shooting women was out of resentment towards his own mother and because of his inability to establish good relationships with women. He would become sexually aroused in the stalking and shooting of the women and then masturbate after it was over. And this is from Whoever Fights Monsters, the 20 years tracking serial killers for the FBI. Ressler is a profiler. Now, whether we take this as meaningful or not, hard to know. Let's face it, a lot of people in prison are just bored. And if, if someone calls them up and says, hey, I want to come and interview you, they're more than happy to sit there and, and take this person's time up and tell them all kinds of stories. Is this the truth? Is it not? And know that the incentive for wrestlers, hey, I got to the real truth when I interviewed Berkowitz. Look at me. I'm awesome FBI. Uh, maybe, maybe not. And again, we're dealing in this strange realm of the unknown and the unknowable. So, from his parole hearing, what do we know about Berkowitz? Berkowitz replied, yes ma'am, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't understand what happened. It was a nightmare. I was tormented in my mind and my spirit. My life was out of control at the time. I have nothing but regret for what happened. What was this torment, she probed. Well, it was just my mind was not focused right. I thought I was a soldier for the devil and all kinds of crazy things. I had the satanic Bible I was reading. I just got stupid ideas out of it. I'm not pushing the blame on anything. I take full responsibility. But I just at the time, things got twisted. And again, to what extent do we want to take this as meaningful? I mean, Berkowitz could easily be lying. He's, he's talking to the parole board here. Who knows? Right? Again, unknown and unknowable. So David Berkowitz now? Well, he's renamed himself. He's the son of hope, and he operates a website. Look it up. You can probably find it. It, it changes every now and again. This link may still be live or not, but uh, he, he, he's preaching the gospel. He's aligned himself with Christ, and, uh, and now he's on a mission to make things okay. And I, I don't know. You know, uh, uh, taking folks at face value quite often might be a mistake in this regard, especially within this lecture. So, three states don't allow the insanity defense. Montana, Idaho, Utah, contiguous states, interestingly enough, right? So, uh, what does that mean? They, they just don't have it. Now, revisions and reforms, so five states have abolished it, not guilty by reason of insanity, doesn't exist. One workaround here, one proposed way of getting at this, right, Annika? Are you waking up, huh? Is guilty but mentally ill verdict. So this is perhaps the wave of the future. We'll see how it plays out, right? The guilty but mentally ill allows treatment first, but then the remainder of the time is spent in prison. So basically what we're trying to do is acknowledge you have a mental illness, and that's horrible to be mentally ill. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat you for this mental illness, but at the same time, we're going to hold you accountable for your crime. That is, the mental illness doesn't excuse the crime. It may be an explanation for the crime, and we're going to treat you and get you better. But if that takes five years of treatment, and you've got a 20-year sentence, once the psychologists say you're no longer right, mentally ill, then you've got 15 more years to go, and you're going to spend that in prison. Right? Now, the Insanity Defense Reform Act passed in 1984, and we'll take a look at this here in a, in a minute, eliminated the volitional aspect of Bronner, so that irresistible impulse thing is being increasingly weakened over time. It doesn't really resonate with people. Prohibits experts from giving ultimate opinions. We want to leave it in terms of jury decision making. And the burden of proof is clearly on the defense when you mount not guilty by reason of insanity. That is, you're assumed sane unless you can demonstrate that you're not. Right. So, legal definitions, let's review. The Bronner Rule, defendant is not guilty of mentally disease or defect causes them to lack substantial capacity to either appreciate the criminality of their conduct or conform their conduct to the law, also known as the ALI rule, used in 22 states, allows the jury some latitude in decision making. So basically you have the McNaughton, you have Bronner, and then you have guilty but mentally ill, 
right? And then a couple states, no insanity defense whatsoever. All right, so homework part four. What do you guys think? What should the insanity defense do and how should it be implemented? In our current political climate, let's face it, divisiveness rules. I'm so disgusted in the current political climate, what it's evolved to, let's say, over the last 10, 15 years. That is, hey, I'm on this side, I'm on this side, all we're going to do is the first and foremost rule of our two sides is never to find a common ground or never come to agreement. And I don't know about you guys, but personally, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of hard nose left. I'm sick of hard nose right. And, and here we are in the middle, man, and no one's out to serve us. They're just out to serve their own little positions and, and go to battle, I guess, is their deal. Uh, the Politics used to be about compromise. Now politics is about becoming more extreme, and shit isn't getting done as a result of this, right? Now, this divisiveness rules, I know, right? Positions are rarely reasoned. They're simply based on tribe or party membership. And we can do better than this. And I know you guys can. And I believe in you guys. And I believe in your ability to understand the benefits of open discussion and compromises resulting of that process. So, let us set the example, you guys. So your team is going to have a discussion about the insanity defense. And it's going to develop an agreed upon compromise on how it should be implemented. So regardless what our political stripes are for this assignment, I want us to just have a discussion within your team about what the perfect insanity defense would look like and what the criteria are. Okay? So, and note that your team members are unlikely to agree completely. That, that's the idea, that we formulate a compromise. Right? That's close enough. Hey, I didn't get everything I wanted in this, but you know what? I got part of my agenda taken care of. I got part of my position stated. I got part of my point of view adopted. Right? So, let's have that discussion about the insanity defense. Let's develop an agreed upon compromise of how it should be implemented. Please give a position, the reasoning behind it, and one potential con to your position, because I always want to go back to pros and cons. Obviously, your position kind of demonstrate the pros. Also include a con to your position. This is like two or three paragraphs is, is what I see. Don't worry about the needs assessment. I hope in this lecture that I've taken care of the needs assessment that yes, reform is necessary. Yes, this, this is a, an amazingly weirdly applied system of competency and insanity. Right? That's what the whole lecture was intended to establish that need. Right? So... Uh, what does that leave us? I'm getting excited here. So, uh, and, and, and remember, I, I'm going to admit again, and I'm going to own it, that the, the, the presentation was admittedly centered around extreme cases of policy failure in both design and administration. And we got one more case to talk about. All right, so you have your mission. Should you decide to accept it, you have your homework assignment. Let's close this out. Let us then talk about our last character in this journey. Who am I? Number six. Anybody. Well, this is John Hinckley Jr. John Hinckley Jr. Do we know who that is? Goes back a ways, certainly before your time, uh, for most of us. Uh, not for me, obviously, but for you guys. What can we say? This case stands apart, essentially, from all the other cases we've discussed. Right? And you'll see why here in, in just a minute or two. John Hinckley Jr. is out now for day trips, you know. The guy who wounded and nearly killed President Ronald Reagan and three other men is now allowed to take outside trips, supervised, of course, by relatives and friends. His first stop was dinner with friends. In a two-to-one ruling, the U.S. Court of Appeals voted to give Hinckley some time out of prison. The system is working, stated his attorney, Harry Levine. He's not a prisoner, he's a patient. John W. Hinckley, Jr., now 43 years old, has been hospitalized for 17 years. He was acquitted of attempted murder and assassination on March 30, 1981, highly broadcast shooting. And he escaped on an insanity plea. 
So here it is. We've gone this whole damn lecture, and now we have the first person who's successfully employed an insanity defense, and we get to see what happens as a result of that defense. Now, what do we know about John Hinckley Jr.? Well, let us reference a movie here right off the bat. Who do we have here? We have a young and very fit Robert De Niro. Yes, that is. And he's portraying Travis Tritt, the taxi driver, in the movie of that name, Taxi Driver. Now, in this movie, Travis Tritt is a Vietnam veteran who, then in New York, is having headaches, is having issues. He decides that he's going to become a taxi driver. He works at night. In the daytime, he spends an awful lot of time in the confines of his tiny apartment working out, physically preparing himself. What is he doing? He buys four illegal firearms because firearms are illegal in New York. Handguns are illegal in New York at this time, right? Now, the character in this movie the, uh, of Travis Tritt's affection is this woman who's working for a political candidate. The woman working for the political candidate spurs, spurns Travis Tritt's uh, affections. And he actually shows up at a speech from the candidate with the intent of killing the candidate. Uh, Secret Service identify him as a potential threat, move towards him, Travis Tritt escapes, not to be found again. So he's driving the streets of New York at night, and he uh, then encounters a young prostitute played by Jodie Foster, uh, very young Jodie Foster, right? And he kind of sets himself up as her guardian angel. The movie ends with Travis Tritt, the taxi driver, going into this apartment building that's being operated as, as a den of prostitution. And, and he chases out, he, he, he kills the pimp, he chases out the John, right? And the movie's kind of ironic, because at the end of the movie, Travis Tritt is awarded, uh, you know, uh, not a medal, but, but, but some kind of accolade by the police department for helping clean up crime on the streets. I mean, it's, it's just a twisted movie altogether, right? So... But Jodie Foster, there's Jodie Foster, the ever-attractive Jodie Foster. Well, it appears that Hinckley might have, in fact, attempted to assassinate Reagan in line with the movie Taxi Driver to impress Jodie Foster. I kid you not. This is a very strange plot line. Uh, as we say, truth is often stranger than, than fiction. Now... The actual incident was outside of a, a, a big hotel, and Reagan had met and spoken to people there. And in this picture, we can see Reagan outside the hotel, right, entering into the presidential limousine, and he's waving to folks. He's waving to people, saying, hey, how you doing, as he gets into the limousine. At this point in time, while he's waving, we have Hinckley, over that direction, kind of where the camera is, produces 22 revolver and opens fire on the president and the people surrounding the president. Okay. So at this point, you see the shot has been fired, the Secret Service is getting busy, and they're shoving Reagan into that limousine. I mean, literally, physically shoving him in, closing the door, and they're going to speed away. This is what the Secret Service are trained to do. Highly trained people, super effective at what they're supposed to do. Now, they got Reagan in the car. The Secret Service agent is still on top of Reagan, shielding him inside the car. And what they're trained to do now, the Secret Service starts running his hands over Reagan's body. And as he runs his hands over Reagan's body, he detects blood, and then he orders the driver of the limousine to the hospital. At which point, they find that the bullet has gone in and lodged by Reagan's lung. Uh, Reagan almost died as a result of this uh, shooting. So, divided appeal court panel cleared the way Friday for John Hinckley Jr. to make a supervised day trips from the hospital where he's been confined since he tried the, uh, to assassinate former President Reagan. The two to one ruling such trips should be decided by the court but should be up to the doctors treating Hinckley at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. So, not guilty by reason of insanity, he successfully pled he was sent to the hospital. Now, 
what are we going to do? Is Hinckley going to be punished or is he going to be treated? Well, ultimately, not guilty by reason of insanity says he should be treated until he's no longer deemed to be disturbed and no longer deemed to be a threat. So now we have psychologists saying, hey, the guy's good to go. I mean, the depression's in remission. He's good to go. Uh, he needs to be allowed these day trips, and he needs to be reintegrated into society. But now the courts are saying, holy shit, no. This guy tried to assassinate the president. He's never getting out. But, and they said, no, not guilty. About so now we have this conflict, essentially, between psychiatrists saying he's okay and people in the legal system saying, you can't release this guy. That, that's ridiculous, right? So... The ruling means, though, that Hinckley, accompanied by hospital personnel, may leave St. Elizabeth's for short visits with his family and friends. His doctors support letting Hinckley make such visits as part of a gradual re-entry into society, the eventual goal of releasing him from St. Elizabeth, right? And uh, I'll, I'll jump ahead. This, this has, in fact, occurred. He's not a prisoner. He's a patient, and he has a right to treatment, Levine says. Now... December 2005, so we got some updates as we move along here. Federal judge ruled that Hinckley would be allowed, su uh, allowed visits supervised by his parents to their home outside of Washington, D.C. The judge ruled that Hinckley could have up to three visits of three nights and then four visits of four nights, each depending on the successful completion of the last. And all the experts testifying at Hinckley's 2005 conditional release hearing, including government experts, agreed that his depression and psychotic disorder are in full remission and he should have some expanded conditions of release. Okay. So Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity in 82. He shot Reagan to impress Foster. His doctors have said the depression and psychosis are in full remission. Okay. And since last year, he's been allowed occasional local overnight visits with his parents of 50-mile radius. But the government is still not having any of this, or certainly doesn't want to. Hinckley's seeking increase in the length of his visits. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. In his mother's home in Williamsburg, Virginia, from six nights to nine nights, he also wants to do volunteer work during the visits and get a driver's license. Prosecutors are opposing the hospital's proposal to allow Hinckley to perform volunteer work in the District of Columbia unaccompanied for up to two hours twice per week. Assistant U.S. Attorney Thomas Zeno said the request to expand Hinckley's release was premature and insufficient to guarantee the safety of the community. Prosecutors stre stressed Hinckley's lack of initiative in finding a volunteer position. Prosecutors also said Hinckley's personal relationships show a pattern of inappropriate dating more than one woman at the same time. Bear that in mind, you guys. Right? No dating more than one person at a time. They quoted a doctor who said Hinckley was, likes to stockpile women, but didn't present evidence he mistreated them. So now, where are we at? Well, the, the story continues, as you know, the plot thickens. The members of the legal team representing presidential assistant John Hinckley say they are owed significant legal bills and arrears or asking the judge, judge's permission to bow out of Hinckley's case. They say, we've got to keep working for this guy, but the bills are going unpaid. Right? And what do you do in that situation? Because Hinckley's from a wealthy family. right? In fact, Hinckley's family was pretty well connected to George Bush Sr.'s family, right? But that's just an aside. The legal team representing Hinckley during 13 days of testimony in late 2011, early 2012, St. Elizabeth Hospital proposal allowed Hinckley to have longer visits his mother's home in Williamsburg, Virginia. Hinckley, as of now, spends 10 days a month visiting his widowed mother in her late 80s. In 2011, St. Elizabeth proposed allowing Hinckley two 17-day visits followed by six days lasting six days lasting 24 days. Uh, and and St. Elizabeth requested the authority to decide whether Hinckley could be released on convalescent leave, which would make him a permanent outpatient. And that has uh, since occurred. Right? So the man who shot President Ronald Reagan has been released from mental hospital after more than 30 years of treatment and rehabilitation. He's going to live with his elderly mother in Virginia. Uh, Mr. Hinckley Jr. was released Saturday morning. The Associated Press, or, uh, Press and Washington Post reported will live in Williamsburg. He's visited multiple times for short trips. And as part of his conditional release, he will be banned from speaking to the press. He has to work three days a week. 
he can be allowed to drive no more than 30 miles from his mother's home, 50 miles if accompanied, and he has to see a psychiatrist two months, uh, twice a month. So when we ask what happens when people are found not guilty by reason of insanity, well, in an extreme case like Hinckley, treatment and then the assessment of the lack of dangerousness, right, and uh, the remission of the disorders allows for the release. And as much as the prosecutors demonstrate a distaste for this situation, uh, you know, this in fact is essentially the ultimate consequence of not guilty by reason of insanity when it's accompanied by effective treatment, right? Uh, as much as it pains us. And this, this creates all kinds of dilemmas. What, what can we say about this? I got some pictures here for you to show you the, the actual incident. Here, uh, the shooting is taking place outside the hotel, and you can see the Secret Service going every which way to put an end to this. Uh, this picture I find just especially fascinating. What we see here, I believe this is Press Secretary James Brady, who was shot in the head right and suffered per permanent brain damage as a result of this and his wife Sarah Brady developed handgun control international uh, to uh, as a gun control uh, vehicle right so you can see I believe this is probably Hinkley down here who's being smothered by the the secret service agents or maybe he's there hard to know I, I think what impresses me more than anything is this secret service here agent here has produced an Uzi out of nowhere, a 9mm submachine gun. Secret Service is hardcore, man. These guys are highly trained and they're on the spot. And yet, note that Hinckley was able to get close enough with a gun and cause this mayhem to the president who almost lost his life. Right. Further pictures, you can see the melee. At this point, I think the limousine is about to get the hell out of there. Uh, and that's it. Heinous crime, to say the very least. Uh, but some people will maintain that the system's working, that not guilty of reason and sanity. Uh, the jury said yes, we agree. And in fact, then the treatment ensued and uh, the eventual release upon no longer being dangerous. So we're again confronted with the, with the fourth dilemma. And, and here's a term I know that shouldn't be used in psychology. Uh, what is crazy? Or what constitutes what should be the criteria for not guilty by reason of insanity? And, and note that we have several standards, right? We have the Bronner Rule and, and we have the McNaughton Rule as the basic rules in this country with some states not, not getting on the not guilty by reason of insanity bus at all. Or this this desire to replace the verdict with guilty but mentally ill, right? Uh, so what is crazy, but what is not? And, and these are issues that the jury, at least the, the emphasis seems to be on allowing the jury to make this decision. The, the Durham rule was not going to be popular, the product rule, um, because it, it took away the ability of the jury to make the decision. So we have a couple lectures coming up on jury decision making. Well, actually, first jury selection and then a second lecture on, on, on jury decision making. So we're going to take a more uh, a closer look at jurors and, and the perceptions that jurors in which they engage. Right, Annika? And remember, how do jurors think? Because that's where I want to go with this as we move through the course here. That if I can find a logical motive, I'll go there. If I can find an evil, evil motive, I'll go there. But that, if I can't find logic or evil, then insanity increases in its appeal. But when we talk about evil, this is problematic. You know, let's not even get into the psychology and, and, and the concept of evil. Because I don't know where we're going to go with that. Or where we should go with that and what constitutes evil. But that's ultimately where we've been taken by this lecture. And Annika is ready to do something besides listen to me blather on. And you know what? I'm going to bet you guys have had enough as well. So let's call it good. Let's put the end label on it. And I hope you guys have a great day. Uh, and I hope you found this lecture as fascinating as, as I do because... Uh, 
understanding the systemic processes and then understanding the psychopathology, all of it comes together here and just provides for some really thought-provoking content. So I want you guys to have a great day. Uh, Annika and I are going to say later, right? You going to say later? Say later. All right. Bye-bye.